Okay, so we are on the bottom of Tes Zion Ahmed Bey's. We have some catch-up because of Rosh Chodesh. We couldn't, uh, we had to, we were a little pressed for time. But let's, let's take a look at the Gemara. It's about 15 lines, maybe a little bit more than that from the bottom. Um, we talked about the Jewish people being unique and distinct. And now we're going to talk a little bit about David HaMelech. Amr Shmuel Bar Nachmeni, Amr of Yenasan, my dirsiv Nuum David ben Yishai. These are the words of David ben Yishai, Unuum Hagever, who come all. And these are the words of the man who was established on all. Now, what do those words mean? Nuum David ben Yishai, Shehikim Ula Shel Chuva. These are the words of David who established the yoke of tshuva. Because we were talking about how David HaMelech uh, really was an exemplar for repentance, for tshuva. And so, Omar, Elokei Yisrael, <clears throat> Li, and then another pasuk in relation to that, it says as follows, um, and it's also again in the end of Shmuel Beis, Omar, Elokei Yisrael, Li, Diber, Tzu Yisrael, Moshel, Ba'adam, Tzadik, Moshel, Yeras, Elokim. So the words are a little bit cryptic. It basically says that the God says that Hashem speaks to the, the rock of Israel speaks and he rules over man, but the tzaddik rules over the fear of God. So what do those words mean? So, Maika Omar, Omar Abavo Hachi Omar. Eloke Yisrael li diber tzu Yisrael an tzu Yisrael. That God speaks with me, the rock of Israel. Meaning, Ani Moshel Ba'adam. That God says, I rule over man. Obviously, Hashem is control, controls mankind, but me moi shall be. But who rules over me? Who controls me, says Hashem? Tzadik, it's the righteous person. Sha'ani gozer gezeira umevatla. That I will make a decree, and the tzadik has the power through his prayer and through his pious acts to be mevatl the gezeira, to take away the evil decree. Next, <clears throat> also in relation to that par- to that parak in at the end of Sefer Shmuel, it says Ela Shemos Hagiborim Asher LeDavid. These are the names of the mighty warriors that David HaMelech had, and the first one that's in the list is Yoshev Besheves. And as we're going to see, the Gemara is telling us that these are not individuals who were distinct from David, but rather these are characteristics that David HaMelech himself possessed. These are the names of the mighty traits or deeds of David HaMelech. Yoshev Besheves. So the first name that David is given is Yoshev Besheves, which means sitting at the place of sitting. So what does that mean? Sabach el khir. Bishasha Yoshev bi Yeshiva, Lahaya Yoshev al Gabe Karimu Kisasas, Ella al Gabe Karka. That David Hamelech, when he was the Rosh Yeshiva and he was teaching Torah to the Talmidim, he would not sit on the customary cushions that were befitting the Rosh Yeshiva, but rather he would sit on the floor in humility. The Cholkam at the Hava Rabbe Ira Haya Iri Kayam, Hava Masti Lula Rabbana Lagabi Karimu Kisasas that during the lifetime of his Rebbe, Ira Hayairi, who was one of the teachers of David and who was a great scholar in David's time, when he would be teaching in the yeshiva, he would sit <coughs> on cushions as a sign of distinction. But But when Ira Hayairi passed away, and David took over as the lecturer in the yeshiva, he would not sit on cushions, but rather he sat on the floor. And they said, please, Rebbe, you should sit also on the cushions, and he refused the honor. That's why I don't sit on cushions today. I just want to know that. Okay, another name that was given to David HaMelech is... Tachkemoni. Tachkemoni is another name of a gibor, but it's really descriptive of a trait of David HaMelech. So Amar Rav, Amar Lo HaKadosh Baruch Hu Hol V'Yishbal Ta'atzmecha Tehei Kamoni. So Tachkemoni could also be read as Tehei Kamoni, that you shall be like me, David, that because you have lowered yourself, you have humbled yourself, then you will be like me. Shani gozer gezeira ve'ata mevatla. In other words, you are in the same level as I am. I make a decree, you have the power to annul it through your righteousness. So, Rosh HaShalishim, and who was this Tach Kamoni? He was the head of the Shalishim, which could either mean the officers, but it could also have to do something with Shalosh, with three. Tehei Rosh Lishloshes Avos, that you will be the head of the three patriarchs, meaning that you're right in line with them. Hu Adino HaEitzani, 
And this is also another name that is written in that list in Shmuel, Adino Ha'etzani. Now, what do those words mean? That could just be a, a name of a person. But no, that the word Adino means to humble himself, to hunch himself over in humility. When he would teach Torah, that's the posture that he took. But when he went out to war, he took a completely different uh, uh, position. He would harden himself and be tough like a piece of solid wood. And that's the word Ha'etzani, the, the man of wood. Al meos chalal bepam echas. The next part of the Pasuk says that he used to be able to fell 800 corpses at one time. And what does that refer to? It's not in one of the giborim of David, but David HaMelech himself had that power. That he would shoot an arrow, and it would be able to go through 800 enemy uh, combatants and kill them all at one shot. Sort of like the CGI films that we see today about, you know, the... the, the you know, the, the archers, whatever. But he David sighed in remorse over the fact that he could only fell 800 and not 1,000. He, he sighed over the 200 that he couldn't, uh, uh, the other 200 that he couldn't knock down. Because as the Pasuk says that Moshe marveled, how can it be? Uh, the Jewish people will say that one man can fell 1,000 soldiers. So how come David says that if Moshe said that you can knock down a thousand, how come I'm only knocking down eight hundred? So Yatsa Sabaskol the Amra Rak Bidvar Uriahiti. That therefore we have at the end also in Sefer Melachim it says that David Hamelach followed Hashem to the T except in the matter of Uriah Hachiti, who was the first husband of Bathsheba, that whole scandalous episode, that was the one area where David HaMelech fell short, and that's the reason why he only succeeded in felling 800 combatants and not the full 1,000. Why 200 are missing out of the 1,000? Okay, there needs further examination and analysis. Amar Rabbi Tanchum Berei de Rabbi Chia Ish Kfar Ako. Amar Rabbi Yaakov Bar Acha Amar Rabbi Simloi. All of these rabbis are quoting each other. The Amri La and others say Amar Rabbi Tanchum Amar Rav Huna Amar Rabbi La Amar Rav Huna Lechudei. Dispute as to who was the author of the following statement. Talmud Shenida Lichvodu Ni Duyoni Doi. We saw yesterday the same halacha that if a Talmud in other words, someone who is not the highest, the Gadol Hador, but he's, his, but he's nevertheless a Talmud Chacham, he, if he puts someone in Nidoy, not because the person is in gross violation of Halacha, but rather because it was a personal, he personally insulted this Talmud Chacham, let's say, you know, he disregarded this person, and he said, ah, you don't know what you're talking about, and then he walks away and turns his back on him. So if he puts him in Nidoy, that's a valid nidoy. In other words, that's a legitimate nidoy. Don't think that because he's doing it for, because of his own personal insult, it doesn't count. It still counts. The Tanya, menudul arav, menudul atalmid, menudul atalmid, edem menudul arav. Because look, we learned in the Bryce that we saw this yesterday, that if a person is under nidoy, but the nidoy was placed by the Rosh Hashiva, so then all those who are, who are subsidiary to the Rosh Hashiva also have to comply with the ban. But if a person was put under a ban by this, by one of the students, then the Rosh Hashiva does not have to be, uh, is not a, a subsidiary of the student, and therefore does not have to comply with the ban. He can still interact with that person. But it's only the person who's the superior of the Talmud does not have to participate in the ban. But everyone else does. So you see that the Nidoy is still a valid Nidoy. So what kind of Nidoy are we talking about in that case? If we're talking about that the ban was put on to this person because he was in violation of some halacha, something that's against the Torah, then how can you tell me that the Rosh Hashiva is not does not have to comply with the ban. There's no such thing as honor when it comes to the honor of Hashem. So we can't, you can't tell me that this guy did an Avera and I don't have to comply with the need. Just because the Talmud put it on, if he offended Hashem in some way, then everyone has to be part of the need. 
So you must conclude that he didn't really do any violation of halacha, but he just insulted this particular Talmud Chacham. And in that situation, the nidoy is still a valid nidoy. So that's our proof. Couldn't you say, though, that every time that somebody... I mean, you can't... This is not an ego thing for these... For, for the individuals, it must be only, we have to understand that it must be because it's ultimately a... a it's, it's, it's a slight to, well, it's a slight to cover that Torah. Right. But, uh, but he, he, the point is, is that even though there's a certain subjectivity to that, and there's a certain prejudice that every person has, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe the guy's right. Maybe I'm not up to snuff. And he was right to disregard me or to insult me. But nevertheless... I, you could argue, no, but the fact that I'm a Talmud Chacha means that I have cert, I'm vested with certain authority that I can put that person under a ban. Amr of Yosef. So you see, Bob, there's a certain, certain uh, uh, sort of tight wire that we have to maneuver here uh, when it comes to Talmidei Chachamim, that sometimes, even though they're not completely up to snuff, uh, we still have to give them covered even though they may not be fully deserving of that covet. As we're, and this is sort of like the theme of the Gemara here, this sort of this, this equivocation about people who are not the greatest, but they're still Torah scholars. Amr of Yosef, Servamir Rabbanan Avedina Lenafshei, Bemilsa de Psikolei. If a Talmud Chacham is absolutely certain about the Psak Halacha, then he can paskin even on areas which he is a party to. So therefore, for example, let's say you and I have a dispute. You say that you don't owe me $100. I say you owe me $100. I can pass him, you owe me, give me 100 bucks. <laughs> In other words, which is pretty self-serving, of course, when you think about it. But the Gemara says, as long as the Talmud Chacham is absolutely certain, there's, it's black and white in his mind, so then he's allowed to pass and render a psaq halacha, even though he benefits from that psaq, which is a startling thing. Where's the object? Where's the... Yeah, where's the object? I don't know how to explain this. I don't know how to explain this. It needs further analysis. Rashi just says, Shavadai um, hulo velo safeg. I'm absolutely certain. I would never do this personally because I would never say that I'm absolutely certain. I would want to bring it to a third party. So I don't understand how, where, and under what conditions we apply this halacha tzarechia. Hahutzur. By an aveda also, if he gives a simen, we take his word. That's something different because we he has an extra nemanus, but here he's an ogeya badav, right? So I'm not. It's it's a little bit difficult to understand, but tzarechia. Hahutzur v'merabanim dahabusanu shum ane. So now the Gemara tells us a story that there was a certain rabbinic scholar who there was rumors about him. And as we'll see, it has to do with the fact that he was, uh, there was rumored about him that he had committed some kind of sexual impropriety. Amar Reb Yehuda hechiliavitz. So Reb Yehuda says, what should we do? Lishamte tzrichile rabbana. To put him into Nidoy, he's got a big yeshiva, and all the Talmidim are going off to the yeshiva. So we need him. We need him as the Rosh Yeshiva. Loli shamte kamischel shema dishmaya. But if we don't put him in, under Nidoy, then it's going to be a chilol Hashem, because people are going to see this guy gets off with impunity, and here he is, just because he's a rabbi, we don't call him on acting in this deplorable way. You can almost associate this with uh, current events. You know, in our own times, we see these kinds of dilemmas. So, so they asked Rabbi Barbarchana, "Do you have any advice? Have you heard anything from your from your teachers?" Pasuk in Malachi, which we read in one of the Haftorahs, it says that the lips of the Kohen shall preserve knowledge, and they shall seek Torah from his mouth because he is an angel of God. Now, it, the, we, we learn from this Pasuk is, And that teaches us that his behavior has to be exemplary like a Malach, and only then can you seek Torah from his lips. But if he's doing things that are deplorable, then I don't care how big of a Talmud Chacham he is, I don't care how big his yeshiva is, you get rid of the guy, you get rid of the bum, right? And therefore, because he's not a Malach, you got to get rid of them. But and you don't... said there was a rumor and not Adis. Okay, was... that's something oh. else. So we have to, that also requires analysis as to what, what, to what degree does the rumor have to rise to. That we won't discuss either today. Because but the it also... The church didn't know this person. Anyway, so Shamte Rav Yehuda, so Rav Yehuda put the guy in Cheir. Based on that, what he heard from Rabbi Bar Barchana, 
he put the guy in Cherem, and Lesoif Ichlish Rav Yehuda, actually Nidoi, not Cherem, sorry, remember we learned there's a difference between the two. Rav Yehuda then became quite ill. Asu Rabbanan Lishiyulei Bei, Va'asi Yunomi Ba'adayu. So the rabbis came to visit to be Mavakar Chayla, and this fellow who was under Nidoi also came, because like we saw, the, only when you're under Cherem do you have to distance four almas from, it, from, from everyone from him. But this guy's just under Nidoi. We're not going to do business with him, but if he wants to come be Mavar Kachola, we're not going to stop him. So Kachazi Rav Yehuda Chayich. Rav Yehuda sees the guy, and he begins to smile. So this fellow detects that Rav Yehuda is mocking him or taking relish in the fact, I got you. So So the guy says to Rav Yehuda, it's not bad enough that you succeeded in putting me under Nidoy. You're also mocking me or you're also you're smiling at it as well. So Oh, listen to this. Rav Yudah says, I'm not smiling at you. I'm not taking pleasure in your downfall. I'm taking pleasure in the fact that I'm about to go to the next world. And I can go with a clear conscience knowing that when I get to the next world, I can tell them that I was not obsequious or flattering or intimidated by anyone, not even a Rosh Hashiv of your stature. When it comes to bringing someone down who's a bum, I brought you down and I did the right thing, even though it, other people might have been intimidated to do such a thing, but I can take pride in the fact I can go, with a, I can go to the Olam HaEmes with a clear conscience. So anyway, Nach Nafshe the Rav Yehuda, Asila Bey Medrusha, Amrlahu Sharuli. So Rav Yehuda then unfortunately passes away from that illness. And so this fellow who was under Nidoy comes to the base Medrash and says, I need someone to take the Nidoy off. I can't, Rav Yehuda's not available anymore. So Amrle Rabbana and Gavr de Chashiv, Rav Yehuda Leka, Chadalishrilach. I'm sorry, there's no one here in the base Medrash of Rav Yehuda's stature who can remove the Nidoy. El Azila Gavi de Rav Yehuda Nesia de Lishrilach. But go to Rabbi Yehuda the Nasi, as we'll learn, the Nasi can remove anyone's nidoy, so go to him, maybe he'll remove the ban. So Azalakame, so he comes to him, and Amrle la Rabbi Ami Puk Ayin Bedine imi boy la Mishrele Sharile. So Rabbi Yehuda Nasiya doesn't know this guy, doesn't know his story. So he tells his uh, his chaver, Rabbi Ami, do me a favor, go and examine this guy's case. And if you feel that either we don't have enough evidence, right, or you feel that he's already paid his paid enough uh, penalty, then you can remove the ban. So I and Rabami Bedine Sarvala Mishrale. So Rabami looked into it and he and he compassionately thought, you know what, maybe we should remove the Nidoy. So Ahmad Rabshmul Bar Nachmeni Al Raglov, and at that moment he was in the base matters talking to Rabbi Udanasiya. Rabshmul Bar Nachmeni is listening in, and you see he's an elderly man. He gets up on his feet, Vaamar Uma Shivchushal Bas Rebi Lanagu Chachamim Kalus Rosh Beniduya, Shaloshanim, Yehuda Khabe Reno Lachas Kama Vakama. He says, No, you can't remove the ban. He says, Look. Look, the handmaid of Rebbe, right? She put a man under Nidoy, and the rabbis respected her ban for three years. So how can you, if they did that to the to the shifcha of Rebbe, how can you remove the ban of our of our great colleague Rav Yehuda so so cavalierly? So Amr of Zera might to come on. We'll see that story in just a moment. So Amr of Zera might to come on to asa itna haisabe bevei medrasha to hakamishne lo asa. So he says, what's going on? What a strange, miraculous coincidence. This fellow, Rav Shmuel Bar Nachmeni, right, who was an elderly man, it's been years since he's shown up in the base medrash, and all of a sudden today he comes and shows up. What's going on? So it must be, a, from heaven it was decreed that this person uh, is not meant to have the nidor removed. The fact that Rav Shmuel Bar Nachmeni happened to be in the base medrash today of all days is a, is a sign from heaven. So la sharak so therefore they did not remove the nidoy and nafak kikabachi va'azil. And so this fellow, this poor Rosh Yeshiva who was the, did the things inappropriate, he leaves with the nidoy still upon him, crying and walking out on the street. Asa zibora v'tarke ya'amse v'shachiv. A bee came along, stung him on his male organ, and he died. So that's not a good way to die. Um, uh, but Tosfa says it was Mida Kineged Mida because it was an affirmation that the rumors about him were true, that he had committed some kind of, imp- of lewd impropriety. So Ayeluhu Lama'arata de Chasidi Veloki Bluhu. So they took his body for burial. They took him to a cave of burial. You know, this guy, is a, he must have had one of those big uh, signs, you know, uh, that went up 
uh, you know, Nafal Ateris Roshenu, you know, uh, we've lost the great, uh, great Rosh Hashiva, and now it's time for the burial. So they took him to the burial of where all of the great pious people were buried to bury him. And there was a snake at the entrance to the cave that refused him entry. They wouldn't let him, the snake would not let him be buried there among the pious people. But then they took him to the burial site of where Dayanim were buried, and there they Taka did accept him. But the question is, what did he do to merit to be buried amongst Chashava Dayanim, if he really was so dastardly? So my time, because he did have a saving grace, and what was that? Because Datanya Rabbi Loi Omer, Imroa Adam Shiyitzrum the Rabbi Loi, it says the very famously often misquoted halacha that if a person is overcome by a Yetzir Hara that he cannot control then it's better for him not to commit the sin in a place where people know him but rather he should wrap himself in dark black clothing I don't wear black suits normally, right? Should wear himself, wrap himself in black clothing, go to a place where no one knows him, and then let him commit the aver, do whatever he do, do whatever he needs to do, right? So better to do that than to be than to do a chilul Hashem, so that people should know that he's an avrayan. Now, what does that mean? It doesn't mean, as people think, that the Gemara is giving you a heter to do uh, to to, uh, to to meet up with a prostitute. It's telling you that if if it's if you know you're going to do the avera anyway, so minimize the, the the damage that is going to be caused by the avera and do it in a place where no one will know you. That's what the Gemara is saying. It's not giving you a heter. And Tosfos even says further that by wearing the black clothing and exiling yourself, your heart will become contrite and humbled, and that'll be a cause for you not to do the Aveira in the first place. Now, Shiv Chashel Beis Rebbe Mai, what was the story about that handmaid of Rebbe who put a guy under Nidoy for three years? She once saw a man striking his adult son. Now, this is a terrible Avera, because to strike small children, the Gemara does sanction, because it helps discipline them. But to strike an older child, you're, you're, uh, you're, um, no, you're um, provoking, you're, you're provoking the child to retaliate. And if a child strikes a father, he's Chayev Misa. So you're causing a child potentially to do a terrible, terrible avera. That's lifnei lo sitein michshal. You're causing a stumbling block for this person uh, because, and therefore lihavi ahu gavra b'sham to cover mishum lifnei iver lo sitein michshal. And therefore, I'm putting you under nidoy. The handmaid of Rebbe says she says she goes out of the house and she sees this man hitting his his adult son. How old is an adult son? It's unclear from the poskim. There's a difference of opinion. Some say he's got to be in his twenties. Some say he could even be a teenager. But if you strike him and you intimidate him to strike back, then you're, you're committing a terrible avera and you belong under a ban. That's exactly what the Pasuk is referring to. Reshlakish was once watching, he was hired to watch over an orchard. A man comes along, walks into the orchard, and starts eating some of the fruit. He starts eating some of the, the figs. Rama Bey Kalav, he says, Hey, man, what are you doing? Stop! And the guy just ignores him, blows him off. Amar Lihavi Ahu Gavr Bisham to Suresh Lakish says, I declare that you're going to be under a Nidoy, right? Because you disregarded my, my edict. So Amar Lei Adarab, Lihavi Ahu Gavr Bishamta. I say, so the man yells back at him, Adarabba, you're the one who's under the ban for illegally placing a ban on a person. You can't just place a ban on a person just because you want to. So imamun is chayavti lacha, nidu is chayavti lach. Just because, okay, fine, you want to assess me financial payment, I have to make payment for the figs that I ate, take me to a basin and do it the right way. You just can't willy-nilly just put a person under a ban just because you don't like the way he looks or you think that he's doing something wrong, so, so Reish Lakish comes to ask a Shaila, did I do the right thing or not? So, and, and what's, the, what's my status? So they tell them, you know what, that guy was right. His nidoy taka is a good nidoy because you did something that deserves nidoy. You put someone under an illicit nidoy. His nidoy doesn't count. Your nidoy, the, the nidoy that you put, put on that guy is, is meaningless. So umaita kante, so Resh Lakir says, so what am I supposed to do? Now I'm under nidoy now. What should I do? Zil lagabe delish lach. Go to him and ask him a chile. He'll lift the ban. 
So lo yadan alay. So Reish Lakish says, I, but I don't know who the guy is. He ran away. So I'm rulei zil lagabi nesia the lishri lach the tanya nidu who ve'nu yadam mini day who yelech eats on nasi the yater lo nidu yo. So he said, okay, fine. So go to the nasi. The nasi will remove the ban from you because the halacha is that if you don't know who put you in nidu, you can go to the nasi. He has final authority to lift anyone else's ban. Amar of Huna beusha hiskino av basin should sarach ein menadin oso ela omer lo hachbeid v'sheiv v'vesecha. Rav Huna says in Usha they made a rule. If an av based and the head of a based and does something inappropriate in his behavior, we don't immediately put him under nidoy. We just put him under house arrest. As it says in the Pasuk, Hachbeit, confine yourself or lower yourself and sit in your house. Now, Chazar Visarach, but if he doesn't comply, he still is behaving inappropriately even after we place him under house arrest, then we talk to put him under nidoy because we have to avoid the Chil Hashem once the word gets out that he's behaving in this way. Upliga de Reish Lakish, and this argues with Reish Lakish, the Amar Reish Lakish, Talmud Chacham Shesarach Ein Menadin Oso Befarhesia. He says, under all circumstances, you never put a person who's a Talmud Chacham under a public nidoy, Shenemar Vechashal Tahayom Vechashal Gam Navi Imecha Laila. That you shall stumble today, and so too the prophet that is with you will stumble at night. And what that means is Kisehu Kalaila, that you have to cover up his sin like night. In other words, Reish Lakish, there's a Chilol Hashem that could go either way. You understand? This is this is the delicacy that's involved. On the one hand, you want to make sure that he, no one thinks that he's above the law just because he's a rabbi. So therefore, if no people know that he committed a crime, on the one hand, it's argued that you should put him under nidoy. But Reish Lakish says there's a Chilol Hashem in the other direction. If you make a public issue about this guy who's such a Talmud Chacham and is now being placed under nidoy, then there's a, a Chilol Hashem in the other direction. So it's a big dilemma where you see that even the Chachamim themselves were we're not sure exactly how to approach the situation. Why would some trespasser get the authority to put anybody under? I mean, just a guy. Why would he? Well, he probably was a Talmud Chacham oh, too. Oh, the fact that he was able to pronounce the halacha that you can't put me under nido indicated that he too was a Talmud Chacham. And why would so, Talmud Chacham go into a field that he just hasn't in it? Right. Title to we don't know. We don't know the background story. Maybe he had permission. Maybe the guy who owned the orchard had told him to go ahead. It was his field. Maybe it was his field. We don't know. <laughs> anyway, Marzutra Chasi. So Marzutra was a very pious man. Whenever he felt he had to put a Talmud Chacham under a ban, he would first put himself under a ban. He imposed the self-ban, and then he would put the other guy in a ban. And the reason he did that, like Tosva says, either because to show the, the seriousness, like, like, it was, like it was painful for him to do this, or to remind him to lift the ban off the Talmud Chacham. So that by that night, when he went to bed, he would remove the ban off himself, and then he would remove the ban off the Talmud Chacham. We'll see that placing a ban on someone is not just a halachic stigma, but it also creates a supernatural a negative effect upon the individual. So that's the reason for doing it. So Amar of Gidol, Amar Rav, Talmud Chacham inada la'atzma umefer la'atzma. Now you see from this story that a Talmud Chacham can put himself under a ban for self-flagellation purposes, and he can also lift the ban off of himself. Amar Rav Papa, teisili do lo shamisi tzorvi merabonin me'olam. That Rav Papa says, I deserve credit because I never had to put a Talmud Chacham under a ban. Ela ki kamichayv tzorvi merabonin sham ta hechi yavit. So if taka, that, there was a Talmud Chacham who needed to be disciplined, what did Rav Papa do? That in Eretz Yisrael, he did like they did in Eretz Yisrael, that if the Talmud uh, Chacham needed to be disciplined, they gave him Malkus instead of placing him under a ban. In other words, there's, it's preferable to give him a physical affliction instead of giving him the spiritual stigma of putting him under a nidoy. My shamta, what is the word shamta, which is another word for nidoy, what does that imply? So, Amar Rav Shem Misa, it's a contraction of two words, the name of death. Ushmul Amar Shemama Yihia, that he shall be desolate. Umahanya Beiki Tichia Bitanura, that this stigma of nidoy stays with a person for the rest of his life, just like smearing the walls of an oven with fat, with shortening, that it absorbs into the walls and never leaves. 
That's the way the Gemara tries to describe it. In other words, the stigma of Nidoi remains with a person for his entire life. Upliga the Reish Lakish, but this is in disagreement with Reish Lakish. Amar Reish Lakish, Keshem Shinichnesis, Bimasayim Vyarboim Shmona Ivarim, Kach Kesha Hi Yotza, Yotza Mimasayim Vyarbo Shmona Ivarim. That Reish Lakish disagrees with that. He says the stigma of Nidoi leaves as completely as it did when it came in. That just like it enters into all of a person's 248 limbs, when the Nidoi is removed, it completely departs parts from the individual and there's no remnant, there's no stigma that remains. Kishahi Nichnas says as it enters the Khsiva Isaha Yir Khairim, that uh, the city shall be Khairim, which means which is the same term that we use to put a person under a ban, and big Khairim Bigamatri Masanvar Boy Mushmonahavu. That Khairim and Gematri is two hundred and forty eight, implying that when a person is put under Khairim, all of his limbs are affected. And Kishi Yotza the Khsiv Barogas Rachim Tiskor, that when it leaves, it also leaves completely all of, out of all two hundred and forty eight limbs because the Pasuk that talks about asking Hashem to be, have compassion after having been angry with us, also the word Rachem is, Rachem is Bigamatria, Hachi Havu is 248. Amar of Yosef, Shadi Shamta de Kalba, Dida Avda, that you can place a Nidoi on the tail of a dog and it'll do what it needs to do. Now, what does that mean? It means that there's a supernatural effect that Nidoi can have <coughs> even on non-human beings. There's a certain magic that it has that when a Talmud Chacham pronounces a person to be a Nidoi, or even an animal a Nidoi, it'll meet its mark. There was a dog in the neighborhood that was eating rabbi's shoes. I don't know why, it liked leather, right? And so they, they didn't know which dog it was. So Visham Tulei and so they decided, they said, you know what, we'll put the dog in Cherem. It libe nura biginufte va'achalte. And so the dog's tail caught fire and it burned the dog alive. And that was its punishment because they put it under Nidoi. Hahu alama to have a kometsar le lahutsur vimerabon. Another story, there was a tough guy, a guy with strength, a guy with either political or physical strength, and he was very, uh, um, he was causing problems for a certain Talmud Chacham. Asa lakami to Rav Yosef, so the Talmud Chacham comes to Rav Yosef and says, Amr, I don't know what to do with this guy. So Amr lay zil shamte. So Rav Yosef says, put him under Nidoi. So Amr lay mistafina minei. I said, I can't, I'm scared of the guy. So Amr lay shakli psicha alei. So he says, so then write a, on a parchment and uh, that will put him into Nidoi. Kol shigen de mistafina minei. So the guy said, but I'm even more scared because maybe he'll find the paper and he'll, he'll, he'll beat me up or kill me. So Amr lay shakli achte bekada. So here's what you do. Take a piece of paper, write that the guy's under a nidoy, and put it in a jug so that no one can see it, and then go to a base akvaros and blow a thousand shofars, which is the, the representation of a nidoy, but do it in a cemetery so that no one will hear it. You'll be out in the middle of nowhere, and do that over 40 days, and you'll see that you'll have an effect on this guy. So Azil Avid Hachi Poka Kada Umis Alama. So the guy, <coughs> the Talmud Chacham, did such, and uh, the fellow, the, 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 on the fortieth day, the jug that had the Nidoy statement in it burst, and that's when the the, the strong arm died. So my Shipure, why do we use the shofar when we put someone under a ban? Shenifroin Mimenu, because shofar is a contraction of the words Shenifroin Mimenu that we exact judgment from that person. My Tavra, and why do we blow a Shvarim to represent that what? Amr Rav Yitzchak, Bered Rav Yehuda, Tavri Bate Rame, that we mean to say that we want to um, be, even big houses shall be felled, shall be knocked down as a result of this Nidoy. In other words, even if you're the toughest and biggest and meanest guy, once the rabbis put you under a ban, you're finished. That anywhere where the rabbis place their eyes with contempt on an individual, that individual either suffers death or suffers poverty. One of the two happens as a result. Let's go weiter. What a beautiful Gemara. And uh, even though we're not ending off on a, on a happy note, but we'll continue along with our mission. The mission had talked about people who are allowed to get a haircut on Cholamoe. And the two, two that were identified were a Nazir and a Mitzora who have their Tuma, their seventh day of Tuma finishes on Cholamoid, and therefore on the eighth day, when in order to bring their Karbanos, they have to get a haircut. So to bring their purification Karbanos, 
they have to get a haircut, and they can get it there for an chalamoi. So, The question that Rabbi Yirmiya asks, we'll see, is a legitimate question. Even though the Mishnah implies that it's only when their days of purification complete in the middle of Yantiv, perhaps it's also true that even though their seven days complete before, conclude before the Yantiv even starts, but they, for whatever reason, uh, they neglected to get a haircut before Yantiv, maybe they can still get a haircut on Chalamoid. So Amr Lei Tanina, yes, we, he said, we learned this in a brisa. Kol Elu Sha'amru Mutarm Legaleach B'moid B'Shelo Hayu Lahem Panai Aval Hayu Lahem Panai He says, the brisa says as a general rule, anyone that is given a heter to get a haircut during Chalamoid, it's only because there wasn't time to take care of it before Yantiv. But if they had time to take care of it before Yantiv, they're not allowed to get, like if the guy gets out of jail before Yantiv, he, and he had time to get a haircut before Yantif, he's not a, doesn't have a heter to get a haircut on Cholamoid. But Nazru Mitzara Afal Pisha Hayelahem Panai Mutarim Shelo Yishu Karbano But the exception to that rule is a Nazar and a Mitzara. Even though their days of purification are completed before Yantif, and they could have gotten a haircut, and they didn't for whatever reason, we still let them get a haircut on Cholamoid. Why? Because since you cannot bring your carbon of purification until you get a haircut. If we don't let you get a haircut on Chalamoid, we're worried that you'll never end up bringing the carbon. So in order to uh, create an incentive for you to bring the carbon as soon as possible, we even let you get a haircut on Chalamoid, even though you could have done it before Yantif. Tana. Hakohen v'ha'avel mutarim b'giluach. The Bryson now tells us that a, both a Kohen, who's just finished his Mishmar, and an Avel, who's just got enough from Shiva, they're allowed to get a haircut on Chalamoid. So the Gemara says, let's analyze both cases. Let's go to the second case first. Hi, Avel Hechidami. What's the case of Avelis? Ilay Meshechal Shmini Shalob Erev HaRegel. Maybe you'll tell me that it's the eighth day on Erev Yantif. Now let's just clarify what we're talking about over here. If a person finishes Shiva, they get up from Shiva, can they get a haircut right away? No, they have to go through Shloshim. There's a special heter that if Shloshim will be broken, by Yantif, we'll let you get a, a haircut on Erev Yantif, right? But it has to be after Shiva, even though it's Mitten Shloshim, but because Shloshim is being broken by Yantif, we let you get a haircut Erev Yantif. So when we say that an Avil is allowed to get a haircut in the middle of Cholamoid, what's the case? If we're talking about a case where the person's, he's already finished Shiva the day before Erev Yantif, and now it's the first day of the Shloshim after the Shiva, so yes. then then why do we give him a heter to get a haircut on Cholamoid? He should have gotten a haircut on Erev Yantif. So, so the Gemara says, well, maybe it's the, the case where the eighth day, meaning the day after Shiva, coincides with Erev Yantif, which coincides with Shabbos. So he can't get a haircut on, on, on Shabbos. But then, then, but then also, he should have gotten a haircut on the seventh day of Shiva on, on Friday. Why? Because the Amar of Chasid Chizda, Amar Ravina Barshila, Halacha Ka'abashol, Shaul, Umodim Chachamim La'abashol, Bishachal Shmini Shal Elios, Bishabbos, Erev Aregel, Shemotu Legalech, Be'erev Shabbos. That the Chachamim agree to Abashol, that even though the seventh day of your Shiva, it's the seventh day of your Shiva, we nevertheless give you a heter to get a haircut on that day in a situation where the eighth day, which would be the, normally the first day to get a haircut, falls out on Shabbos, that's Erev Yantiv. Since there's no other option, we let you get a haircut on Erev Shabbos, which is the last day of Shiva. So the Gemara says, Lo tzricha shechal shvi shelo lios b'Shabbos Erev HaRega. So rather what? We're talking about a case which is less clear, which is a case where the seventh day of Shiva falls out on Shabbos, which is Erev Yantiv. So in that situation, we allow you to get a haircut on Cholamoi because there was no other option before. Tana bira savar la ka'abashol. So the, the question is, so why then does, does our Tana, which our Mishnah, which does not allow an Avil to get a haircut on Cholamoid, why does our Tana not hold that you're allowed to? So, the, so, so we'll explain it as follows. Tana Bera, so the other Tana who get, lets you get a, head, a, a haircut on Cholamoid, Savar la Ka'aba Shol, the Amr mixes Hayom Kekulo, Viyom Shvi, Ololo Lakan Ulakan, the Kivin the Shabbos Havi Anasu. So it works like this. If the, why do you have a head to get a haircut on Cholamoid? Because you've already completed the Shiva, because according to Abba Shol, the seventh day of Shiva, you get up in the morning. 
So mixes Hayom Kikula, we say that a portion of the seventh day is like the whole seventh day. That's the way we paskin, as you all know. You've all seen people get up on the seventh day of Shiva in the morning, right? And therefore, Erev Yantav counts as the beginning of Shloshim after Shiva, and therefore you have a right now to get a haircut on Erev Yantav, but because you couldn't get a haircut on Erev Yantav because it's Shabbos, we give you a dispensation to get a haircut on Cholamoy. That's the, the rationale of the Tana who argues with our Mishnah and lets the novel get a, heter, get, get a haircut on Cholamoy. But Tana di Don Savar la Kirabanan, Dami Lormin and Mixayam Kikulo, the Akati lo Sholem Avelus to Shiva. And why does our Tana not allow an Avil to get a haircut? Because remember, the only way that you can get a haircut is if Shiva is finished and you've started the Shloshim period, which will be broken by Yantif, we let you get a haircut on Erev Yantif. Now, in this situation, according to the Tana of our Mishnah, we don't say Mix Sayam Kikulo. And the entire seventh day, therefore, is the seventh day of Shiva. So, therefore, as Yantif comes in, Shiva is ending, it's simultaneous. There has never been a period of post Shiva Shloshim that would give you a heter to get a haircut before Yantif. And therefore, since you never had a heter to get a haircut before Yantif, we don't give you a heter to get a haircut during Yantif. You'd have to wait until after Yantif before you'd be permitted to get a haircut because you didn't have that moment of Shloshim, of post Shiva Shloshim before Yantif that would enable you to get a haircut. Hi, Kohen, hey, Chidam. So now the Gemara asks the question, let's go back to the case of the Kohen. The Kohen who completes his Mishmar is allowed to get a haircut on Cholomoid. What's the case? If he finished his Mishmar, his week shift, before, before Yantif, then he should have gotten a, a haircut on Erev Yantif. Why are we giving him a heter on Cholomoid? The answer is, is that he finishes his mishmar on the regal itself. So let's say Yantav starts on a Wednesday. So his shift is, uh, it ends on Shabbos. So therefore, he's in the middle of his shift, and Yantav comes in, he couldn't get a haircut. So Tanadi Dan Savar, Kevin Ditnan Bishlosha Prokim Bashana Hayakola Mishmar Shavas Beimur Aregolam of the Chilak Lechem upon him, Kemandalo Shalom Mishmar to Beregel Dummy. So why does our Tana not permit a coin to get a haircut during the Regel? It's very simple, because this fellow is considered to be continuing his shift. And we know the halacha is, is that while a Kohen is doing his shift, he's not allowed to get a haircut. It's only, right, because we want to make sure that he gets a haircut before he starts his Mishmar. So in this situation, because his shift runs straight and directly into Yantif, and we know that on Yantif all Kohanim, have equal participation in the avoda, so it's as if he's continuing his shift because he's still on duty, and therefore he's got to wait until after yantav before he can get a haircut. That's what our tana, who does not give a heter for the kohen, but the tana berasav, or but the tana of the brais who says he can get a haircut, he holds afalgab the shayach b'hanach mishmaros mishmarti miyashlim alei that even though. He's still on duty, participating with the other Kohanim over Yantif, but it's not his particular shift anymore. It's no one's shift on Yantif, and therefore, since his shift is over, we give him a heter to get a haircut on Cholamoid. Tanu Rabbonah. So let's go weiter. Kol elu shamru mutarm legaleach b'moid, mutarm legaleach b'mei evla. The Bryson now says that anyone who has a heter to get a haircut on Cholamoid also has a head there to get a haircut during Shiva. So, for example, a guy gets out of jail on Cholomoed, he's allowed to get a haircut. If he gets out of jail while he's sitting Shiva, he also can get a haircut during Shiva. Frek the Gemara Vahatanya Asurim. I, there's another Brisa that says that if you get out of jail while you're sitting Shiva, you're not allowed to get a haircut. So how do you reconcile these two Brises? Amar of Chista, Amar of Shila, Kitanya Hacha, Mutarein, Bishetachvu, Avelav. The answer is the Brisa that gives you a heter to get a haircut during Shiva is not a standard one-time Shiva. It's where you've got more than one Shiva running into the other. For example, a guy loses his father Nebuch on Sunday, he starts sitting Shiva, and then on Thursday his mother passes away, and so he's continuing Shiva. In that situation, if the second Shiva coincides with another episode, like getting out of jail, we give you a heter to get a haircut during that second Shiva. So the Gemara says, But the Gemara says, well, if he's going through multiple Shivas, then even if he's not one of the people who was enumerated in our Mishnah who can get a haircut during Cholamoid, even if he's just a regular guy, he's 
allowed to get a haircut during that second shiva. The Tanya, Tachvu Avelav Zeacharze, Hich Bitsaro Mekel Bitaro Mechabes Kasuso Bamayim. There's a general halacha that if a person has to go through multiple shivas that go into each other, then during the second, third, or fourth shiva, he's allowed to cut his hair with a razor and allowed to wash his clothes in water. So you see that anyone has that hetter. Doesn't Dafka have to be one of the people that's enumerated in our Mishnah? The Gemara says, no. Ha'itmar Allah Amr Abchiz the Betar Velo B'misparayim B'mayim Velo B'natar Velo B'ahal. The answer is that if a person goes through multiple shivas, plus he has the extra aspect that he's just gotten out of jail or has gone through another one of these things that has precluded him from even before Shiva from getting a haircut, we don't restrict the way that he's going to get a haircut. Because the Bryce says that when we let give a person enter to get a haircut because he's gone through multiple Shivas, we only let him trim his hair with a razor but not with the scissors. We only let him wash his clothes in water but he cannot use any soap or detergent. But if this guy is going through multiple Shivas, plus he just got out of jail, for example, then we let him do a haircut even with scissors and we let him wash his clothes even with detergent. From this discussion, we can infer that an avil is not allowed to wash his clothes. It's clear from this whole discussion. Last thing, very simple. We have a machlokis. Just one Tana says that just like you're not allowed to get a haircut on Cholomoed, so too you're not allowed to cl- cut your nails on Cholomoed. That's according to Rabbi Yehuda. Rabbi Yossi Matin, Rabbi Yossi says it's mutter to clip your nails on Cholomoed. And the same Machlokis is by Avelus. Just like you're not allowed to get a haircut during an Avelus, so Rabbi Yehuda says you similarly cannot clip your nails, and Rabbi Yossi says you can clip your nails. So Ula says, we're machmer like Rabbi Yehuda, when a person sitting shiva, he cannot cut his nails, but we're mako like Rabbi Yossi and Cholomoy that we let you clip your nails. But Shmuel Amar halacha Rabbi Yossi b'moed uve eva. And Shmuel disagrees, and this is how we paskin, that both in Avel and during Cholomoyed, you're allowed to clip your nails. The Amar Shmuel halacha kedivrei mekel be'eva. Because Shmuel said the general rule is by Avelu, since it's older upon in any way, we are generally mekel, and we allow you to do anything that where there's a dispute as to whether it's mutter or usser, and therefore you're allowed to clip your nails even during Shiva. Have a wonderful day. Okay. Okay.